welcome to this taster video on the distributed electron. The full theory is developed in other videos. Here I just want to quickly pull out one particular aspect, how spin can be accommodated into quantum mechanics without the need to make it weird or intrinsic. OK, here's a multiple choice question which is always fun. As a physicist, you develop a theory which explains many odd and interesting features of a subject. Not only does it work mathematically, but you've developed a story to explain how it works. Then suddenly you get some new facts. They don't break your theory, but they don't fit in naturally, and they certainly don't fit in with the story. Do you leave your theory and story alone, declare the new facts as intrinsic, and dissuade your students from questioning further, or become a YouTube content provider to explain your dilemma, or look for a new theory which matches the old and new facts and has a new story to explain them. Of course, the word intrinsic gives the game away. I'm talking about quantum spin. Our story is that we have a point particle whose location is only predicted probabilistically by a mathematical wave function, the solution of the Schrödinger's equation. The chances of finding this point particle are spread out in a cloud of probability. But if we do find it, we find it all. Unfortunately, soon after this story became ingrained within physics, it was found that the particles which it describes are associated with an angular momentum, which we call spin. But a point particle cannot have an angular momentum. Only objects with a finite radius can have this. And while the Schrödinger wave function proves able to predict orbital momentum, which in our story tells us is the point particle whizzing around the nucleus, there are no more parameters available to describe an internal spin of the point particle. It seems that historically, physics has taken the first option. Just tell the world that spin is intrinsic and isn't that weird and aren't we clever having to live with such crazy theories? Meanwhile, there is a living to be made, so might as well do some videos. I'm joking, of course. Obviously, option three makes the most sense. And of course, it must have been tried many times without success. If such efforts had succeeded, we would already know about them, wouldn't we? Physics has tried other stories, of course. The de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory ditches the fuzzy, undefined nature of the electron and views it as a particle which actually exists. That is, it's always present somewhere, but its location and velocity depends on the wave function it is immersed in. The maths is much the same as standard quantum mechanics, but the interpretation is different. The historic importance of this interpretation was to destroy the myth that quantum mechanics was incompatible with so-called hidden variable theories by presenting a counterexample. But it still talks of a point particle and thus it cannot model spin angular momentum. Let's give up on trying to interpret spin angular momentum within present day quantum mechanics. Let's start elsewhere on something that can model it, namely acoustic waves in a medium possessing mass. Just think of sound waves as an example. But of course we aren't specifying what the medium is, just that it exists and is all-pervading. In fact, it's an ether having the required characteristics. Acoustic waves are just longitudinal waves of compression and rarefaction, as shown here. However, when acoustic waves cross paths and have a special relationship between their direction of approach and their phase on arrival at some point, something we could call phase direction correlation, it is an established fact that vortices develop which have angular momentum. 
I've called these vortices field rotators, or just FRs for short. In fact, if we look at four plane waves having this phase direction correlation property, we see that we get a grid of FRs as shown here. And taking a wider perspective, we can see that there are alternating FRs with opposite rotation sense. This is because total angular momentum must be conserved and when the waves set out, that is before they crossed, they had zero angular momentum. The rotating red dot is the centre of mass of a cell, of which more below. So, not yet a great model for quantum mechanics, but an interesting start because we can see spin in both directions and we can also see that it might be possible to understand electrons as spatially extended structures. To develop a candidate model, we need three things. I have covered these in much more detail in the Distributed Electron video and the Road to Quantum Reality series of videos, which give full development of this new theory called Real Wave Quantum Mechanics. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We need the FRs in a grid to somehow interact with each other, the FRs to somehow act as sources by taking energy from the medium, and the amount of energy taken by the FRs to be controlled by some factor, normally called the potential. But try not to think of this as the electric potential, as we are not yet specifying what charge is. It's easy to hang a charge on a point particle, but we will have to be a lot more nuanced. As I said, these things are discussed and explained in the other videos. Once we apply these postulates, we can do some calculations, but unfortunately only for very tightly constrained structures. Nevertheless, we get results such as these, which are isomorphic with the Schrodinger-Dirac equations. By isomorphic, I mean that they have the same form as the Schrodinger equation results, but we need to adjust some parameters to make the fit exact. We cannot yet exactly match the hydrogen atom because it must contain many millions of interacting FRs. We can only manage about 80 by 80 for a 2D calculation. Now, each FR must have some angular momentum, and we can sum these over the entire structure. For the purposes of this short video, the takeaway is that it works, and it gives huge insights into why quantum mechanics is as it is. We have a new story which can match quantum mechanics, and which has the space to include spin angular momentum. So, how about calculating it? Now, I must confess that this has given me many sleepless nights. The way I have done it goes as follows. First, calculate the centre of mass of the FR cell. The method ignores the total mass density of the medium, as this is simply not known. Instead, it concentrates on how much mass has moved to bring about the changes in psi, which here are taken to be representative of a density. The centre of mass found in this way moves in a circle around the centre of the FR cell, and has the radius shown here. We can express lambda, the wavelength, in terms of omega, the frequency, using the general equation for a wave, shown here in violet, which gives this expression. Here, we have also moved the root 2 to the numerator by multiplying top and bottom by root 2. Then we can calculate the distance covered by the centre of mass as d in this expression. And we know that the time for one cycle, capital T, is just the period 2 pi over omega. And hence we get the velocity. And angular momentum is just mass times velocity times radius. So this ought to be easy. But this is where the sleepless nights come in. What is the mass? 
The mass used to calculate the centre of mass was based on psi, but the mass of the structure itself is the sum of all the FR masses and these are based on the absolute value of psi squared. It seems wrong, but the mass we use is the magnitude of psi squared. The justification for this is a bit hand wavy. It is based on the special relativity result E equals mc squared and the intuition that the mass of the structure is entirely indicative of the energy trapped within it. The mass of the medium is unknown to us and actually makes no contribution to the mass of the particle itself. Only the energy of its motion contributes to the mass. It turns out that we reach a similar conclusion when considering orbital angular momentum, which is dealt with in the main series of videos. There, we find that the only thing moving which can give rise to orbital angular momentum is the wave energy of the underlying physical waves. By special relativity, this is a momentum. In fact, it's part of the relativistic four momentum. So we bite the bullet and we get this expression, where mFr is the mass of the fr as explained above. Simplifying, we get... Now we can sum over all fr's and note that the sum of the individual masses is just the mass of the whole structure, which is the electron mass. So mFr becomes me. We can now use the de Broglie-Einstein relationship. E equals mc squared equals h bar omega. And substituting and cancelling, we get h bar over 2. So on this analysis, spin is not intrinsic, but is a normal angular momentum, albeit that the only mass involved is the mass equivalent of the energy content of the FRs. I hope you find this as fascinating as I do, and I welcome your comments. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and share with your physicist friends. And don't forget, if you want to study this theory in more detail, I have done my best to explain it in the Road to Quantum Reality series.